Up until July of 2012, it was the only known marine IS in Trinidad and Tobago uh, until the capture of the lionfish oft in Tobago waters. Now the green, the Perna viridis, the green mussel or the Asian mussel is native to the Indian and Pacific region and it was introduced into the Atlantic region in Trinidad around mid-1990. Now within that genus Perna, there are three other species, Perna um, Perna, Perna, the brown mussel, Perna canaliculus, called the green lip, green lip mussel. Now prior to the introduction or the movement of of the green mussel and to a little extent the brown mussel, um, the geographic distribution of these three species was so distinct that it could have been used initially as a preliminary taxonomic tool to differentiate the different species. Um, yesterday we heard from Jonathan talking about you know, the success of this particular species and, and a lot of this is related to its biology. As you can see, the sexual maturity is within the two to three months of its life. There's high recruitment, very fast growth rates, and it can tolerate extremely wide environmental conditions. And those values you're seeing there, the salinity, temperature, very extreme conditions that have been recorded in the literature. However, they, um, they, they survive and thrive under much more optimal ranges. Now, in addition to some of those environmental, um, environmental conditions that they can exist under, one of which is that they can survive under prolonged biocide dosing that gets rid of most of their competitors, as well as they can, they can be found in areas where there's high velocity, profound, which profoundly enhances spat settlement. And these are the very small muscles. And so you can understand these conditions are very conducive, for example, what, ha what exists in um, power plants, as Jonathan was talking about yesterday. And you can see in late in the presentation, um, this is one of the biggest impacts in Trinidad and Tobago. A bit about the background. Now, prior to the Mityasic project in Trinidad, there was really no research done on the green mussel as an invasive species, despite its introduction as far back as 1990 outside of Agard and Etal, which basically documented its presence in our waters. However, given the fact that this mussel grows very quickly, there was a quite a bit of research on its reproduction and growth rate, as well as um, its use as a sentinel organism for so heavy metals and also for looking at saxitoxin, a PSA um, toxin. And one of the things that we found was that in this particular mussel, there was very low levels in Trinidad as both for the heavy metals as well as the PSA. Now one of the things that this pro project actually facilitated was for us to re-examine the whole Puna Verdes invasion in Trinidad and Tobago. And there were basically three objectives to an ecological assessment looking again at its current distribution patterns as well as the community structure. Because so, as I said, outside of the Agard et al. reference, there was no information for this particular species. We knew it was impacting on the um, industries, so we wanted to look at, do an economic assessment to look at the cost of this organism as a fallen organism on industrial plants. And this, the third objective in terms of building, raising awareness among the, the stakeholders was it evolved from from another objective, and in fact it turned out to be a very important objective simply because where we were starting in Trinidad and Tobago with respect to managing marine IS from ground zero, so to speak. And so we had a, num a series of workshops, we're developing a DVD at the moment, and lots of public awareness um, tools through brochures, newspaper articles, seminars, and of course these seminars also directed to stake, um, specific stakeholders. So some of the methodologies we employed for the ecological assessment to look at the, um, the distribution patterns as well as looking at the community structures of certain habitats. And the habitats we focused on were, the main habitats were mussel beds, habitats, um, mangrove, mangrove prop roots, pier pilings, as well as we wanted to look at uh, the water channels of industrial plants. And we employed the CRIM protocol, which is a particular method for quantifying 
the um, the assessment, and this was based on um, this protocol is going to be used for port biological baseline surveys under the Globalis project. And so we adopted this protocol because we wanted to sh have some continuity with the project. So later on, when we start look surveying these ports, we would use the same, the same survey techniques. Some of the data analysis, we looked at the condition factor of the muscle, the morphometric measurements, as well as indices, the bi different biological indices, to look at the different community structures. The, sorry, the, the community structures of the different habitats. For the economic assessment, some of the objectives we had in mind were looking at the direct damages caused by the Puniveridis, to identify the cost associated with fallen organisms, including the Puniveridis. Um, one, of the, one of the issues with this particular assessment was very difficult to separate the cost, the, the damages direct as a result of Puniveridis as opposed to other fallen organisms because within the industry they do not make any distinctions between the two and they treat everything as fallen organisms. We wanted to classify some of the management strategies and the control techniques used to manage the uncontrolled Puniveridis as well as identify the most effective management strategies. How we collected this information was identifying all the firms that had seawater cooling systems in Trinidad, and this, this study was actually restricted to Trinidad because there are, non, no, there are no um water cooling industrial water cooling systems in Tobago, and this was targeted at petrochemical. Um, these firms produce a wide array of products, petrochemical products, mainly methanol and ammonia, desalinated water and electricity. We employed face-to-face -face interviews using a questionnaire from um, I'm just show this, put this slide up to tell you the importance of our energy sector in Trinidad and Tobago. It provides, it contributes about 44% of our GDP. The revenue generated from the energy sector is over 80%. And, and we, we're actually big players when it comes to ammonia and methanol. Um, in this diagram, you see this is up to 2010. We were actually the leading exporter of methanol in the world. Okay, so it gives you an idea of the size of our operations. Um, the green muscle status, a little later we're going to put up some posters which kind of details the entire ecological assessment. And we, for this um, assessment we were a bit restricted because when we started the survey we found that some of the main habitats no longer existed, certainly the muscle beds. We had very extensive muscle beds, they no longer existed. It was very rare to find Puniveridis on mangrove prop roots, and the main habitats were pier pilings. And we never got permission to actually sample the artificial, the water channels in the industries because of mainly security reasons. So the assessment we had to restrict it to the pier pilings, to the pier pilings. So our assessment was fairly limited in this regard. What we did find though was that there was a high biodiversity associated of the fauna associated with Puniverdis on the pier pilings. Um, the green here highlights where Puniverdis is actually absent in Tobago and here you have the biodiversity is much higher as compared to in Trinidad. Some of the other differences we found was that in certain parts of the country, the Northwestern Peninsula, the samples are extremely large. However, there are, there, are, there are no small individuals, which indicates no active recruitment taking place in this particular area. Um, these photographs here on 1990, for example, it showed what the condition was, what it was like in Kearney Swamp. Now, um, as you can see, Puno, where it is settled on almost the entire prop, well, from the intertidal all the way down to the subtidal region of this mangrove prop root. Now, this was not, this is just an example. It was not typical of every single prop root in Kearney Swamp, but it was very common to find roots like this. The photo adjacent to it in 2012 shows what the condition is like now where it has gone back to what it was before as dominant, um, the dominant species are oysters and mussels, local mussels. And the photograph adjacent to that one shows what the, 
the Perniverdis looks like on, ma on the pier pilings. And the map down below shows the current distribution patterns for the green mussel, where it's very similar to what it was in 1990, where it's still largely restricted to the West Coast. However, in 2010, when 2012, when we had sampled, we're now starting to see a small intrusion on the North Coast. And this is a very recent intrusion where the samples, the samples are very small, very small individuals between, and they range between 20 to 30 millimeters in size. So as you can see, it's a very recent introduction. Um, if we take a look at the regional spread of the Puna since its introduction in Trinidad in, 20, in 1990, it spread rapidly to Venezuela, Jamaica, and then on both sides of the east and west coast of Florida, then down to Cuba, and then almost 20 years later to Colombia. So even though um, some of the recent genetic work suggests that this, in, this introduction within the Atlantic region is actually coming from, came from Trinidad. Okay, we take a, a, a look now back, to, well, a look to the economic assessment. And these were some of the results reported by the firms. And they indicated that there's different species in addition to Puna verdis, which was, damage, which was causing damage to their water cooling systems. These included barnacles, native mussels, Puna, and a growing concern actually, uh, well, since this assessment, are the shipworms. Some of the direct damages caused by the Puna verdis on the system, uh, it, it impacts on sediment tanks, membrane filters, member and me media filters, membranes, pumps, intake screens, and intake pipelines. And basically what it does is not only, it reduces the efficiency of the water cooling systems. Some of the additional costs incurred by these firms were related to a shutdown, the replacement cost, maintenance costs, which is mainly cleaning, chemical costs, and, and labor. This is with respect to employing divers to go and clean these screens and water intake channels. And while it was very difficult to separate um, the costs associated with Perniverdis from the other fouling organisms, there were some examples from some firms where it, it had indicated, for example, in 1990 when Puna was first introduced into Trinidad and the population exploded. This one particular firm, it costs about 160,000 US dollars to start cleaning, well, well, start cleaning and controlling the Puna Verdes. And subsequently, in ensuing years, in 2000, when other methanol and firms um, came into, were established, they also had, and in, they also had, well, this is the value that they, um, they told us that it costed them to control the Puna, and as you can see, the, the costs had started to decline. Now the main, what the firms had identified during the period of 1990 to around 2003, that was the peak period for the Puna Veritas invasion, and subsequent to that, it started, had started to decline. Some of the contingency plans that the firm practice will definitely increase in chemicals, frequent cleaning, or a combination of the two. Some of the management strategies that they're employed were increased routine maintenance, retrofitting equipment, chemical treatment, and there were a range of other strategies. Some of the retro retrofitting equipment, for example, the cost of replacing, um, introducing new type of cooling fans into the system, they can cost up to around 800,000 US dollars. Okay, the most effective technique for controlling the Perniverdis, as you can see, was chemical treatment. And in summary, the total cost for controlling the fallen organisms, and this is a combination of both Perniverdis as well as other fallen organisms, was close to a million dollars, and just over 1.1 million for the total cost of controlling these organisms per year. The average cost worked out to be around 225,000, and the historical average cost specific to Puna Verdes was around $240,000. One of the, one of the um, well, in a way, almost alarming um, thing we found is that increasingly, there was an increasing use of chemicals to control the Puna Verdes. 
um, I just showed this photograph here because this is an example of a water cooling system for a particular plant in Trinidad. And to give you a size of it, this is a person standing here. And this is a backward deck state, so it gives you a relative scale, the size of the, of the water cooling um, tower. And this is actually made up of, a lot of this here is wood. Which, and as I said, there's a growing problem now on, with these industrial plants with respect to the shipworm, which is a boring bivalve. And this is an example of the wood from here being riddled with this shipworm, and I've been trying to get a sample of this, this particular wood to get to be able to identify the specimen because they think it's Torito novalis, which is not native to the Trinidad. Okay, so in terms of the way forward, um, the third objective of this particular project was about public awareness and building capacity within, well, public awareness. Um, and re are raising the awareness among all the various stakeholders. And as I said before, we are virtually starting from ground zero with respect to managing marine IS in Trinidad and Tobago. And so having workshops like this is very important to raise the awareness of all the different stakeholders. And one of the workshops we conducted last year, it's highlighted here, was that we were able to bring many stakeholders together when this particular workshop, we had over 70 participants, which was almost as well, even as slightly larger than this one, where we had stakeholders from not only government agencies, but port facilities, marinas, academic institutions, and NGO and CBOs. And we were able to have presentations, not only from the IMA, but also from industry as well. One of the key things about this particular project, the Pernivertis project, under the Mithiasic project, was trying to build cap capacity at a national level and and of course another way forward because there's a big concern when this project comes in and what happens next and an obvious way forward is trying to build synergies with other national IES initiatives one of the key ones is actually the globalist partnership projects and the globalist partnership project deals specifically with preventing the introduction of marine IS from ballast water. So during this project, over the last two years, we have tried to work very closely with the Globalist Partnership Project. This particular project is set up very similar to the Mithiasic project in they have developed national strategies, working groups, building technical capacity, and there's been a lot of sharing of information between these two projects. And one of the major initiatives under this project is that Trinidad and Tobago has since signed on to the convention or ratified the convention, the Ballast Water Management Convention, as in the process of um, revising their shipping marine pollution bill, which would now incorporate marine IS as a pollutant in an attempt to help manage marine IS in Trinidad and Tobago. To close, I would like to acknowledge the following people. Thank you. <laughs>